this is something I use every day. This is something I'm very passionate about. Uh, and I believe in this statement that came out of the cardiology literature. Uh, I uh, use this on almost every patient that goes through our service. Uh, what I'd like to do here today is kind of inspire you to kind of uh, think about this and maybe little learn a little bit more about it. It's a, uh, it's, it can be kind of an overwhelming uh, conversation because it is such a, lung ultrasound is such a big topic. So uh, I hope you guys uh, will move forward with this. This is really kind of an introduction to pleural or lung ultrasound. And most people, uh, especially physicians in the room who do ultrasound, uh, are kind of shocked by that. And the reason is, is if you look back to uh, Harrison's, uh, uh, it is pretty much on everybody's bookshelf from uh, uh, med school. Uh, back in 2015, they're still saying that ultrasound is, is essentially uh, useless for a lung ultrasound. Even up until this year, Harrison's is still saying that, it, I mean, they're coming around, they're saying that we can use it for pneumothorax, pleural effusion, but to do things like evaluate for increased lung water, they're, they're just not there yet, but it is a rapidly evolving uh, conversation. And it's because of this gentleman, Dr. Daniel Lichtenstein. He's a, uh, 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 an intensivist out of Paris, and he started doing this back in the early 80s. And he has a brilliant book out there, and it's uh, I think I'm reading it for the third time. And it's uh, very academic, and you can really get into the weeds on in this subject. But what he likes to do is he likes to talk about something called ultrasound semiology. And what semiology is, it's the study of an object or something that tells you something else is there. And this is what we do in medicine all the time. We do medical semiology. So if I see that I have uh, a big uh, a C wave on my, uh, my jugular venous pulsation, I can kind of infer that I probably have some tricuspid regurg. And this is what we do every day in medicine. What he did was he asked the question, how, how about if we just look? And if we, if we look at the, the image on the left, we see horizontal lines. If we see the image on the right, we see kind of more vertical lines that move with respiration. Now, it's so easy that they've said that compared to echocardiography, this is kind of, it's, 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 it's the kindergarten of, of what we do with ultrasound. Historically, what we do is we look at chest x-rays, but what I can tell you that is that that, that x-ray is infamous for not being very accurate. On that same patient on the right side, I was not able to find uh, a pleural effusion, yet I took 550 milliliters off of it. So back to the blue protocol, um, people who have problems with breathing lose their airway scares me. I, d I don't like it. And I was uh, thrilled when Dr. Lichtenstein uh, introduced the blue protocol. It's, uh, it's, it's emergency uh, uh, ultrasound. It's, little, it's not critical care. It's a little bit different and it's, it's meant to be uh, something that's utilized uh, in the moment fast to, to give you direction on where to go. And this is the, the, the process. This is the blue protocol. First time I thought of this, it, it really kind of scared me. And I thought I was never going to be able to use it. But once I kind of grasped the process, I, I, I got it a little bit more. Nice thing about it is it's, it's comparatively to, to most other modalities, it's surprising, uh, surprisingly accurate. And regarding accuracy, if you look at the detailed performance of the blue protocol, it uh, really does a nice job, much better than uh, chest x-rays or even physical exam and stethoscope. If you look at it for pneumonia, because and you'll we'll go over all this, be, this profile stuff, but if you look and you see an abnormality that represents one of these profiles, it's again, very accurate uh, for pneumonia. So uh, to start with the blue protocol, they look at the blue points. It's a series of three points. The upper and, and lower blue, the upper is essentially at the uh, midclavicular line at the angle of Louis. Um, it, it pretty much tells you what's going on with the uh, upper lobes. If you go down to the, the, the anterior axillary line at the level just above the armpit, you have the lower, lower blue point. Uh, my understanding is that initially it was is, was was developed to uh, get away from the heart on the left side, but if they found that it correlated to the to the uh, middle lobes and the lingula on the left. If you drop straight down, and that's what they're trying to represent here, and you point up towards the sternum, you have what's called the PLAPS point, the posterior lateral and alveolar or pleural syndromes. 
basically what that is, is it's telling you, do you have a pleural effusion or do you have something going on in the lung which would represent either atelectasis or pneumonia? There's two other uh, things that came out of this description of, of where to look uh, that I use all the time. Uh, at the bottom of the hand, if you drop straight back down, this is the phrenic line. If you go to the mid axillary or the uh, posterior axillary line, you're at the uh, phrenic point. I use that uh, for sniff testing up in the office. So let's start out by talking about normal lung ultrasound. So you put it in the, 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 the with the, the uh, indicator up towards the head uh, in the anterior, the, uh, the anterior chest, the upper blue point. And this is what you're gonna look at. This is the starting point for any lung ultrasound and it's called the bat wing sign. Uh, apparently Dr. Lichtenstein must have thought it looked like a bat. And what you have is you have two ribs and then you have this motion below all the uh, musculature and subcutaneous tissues. That's called lung slide. Already we've learned that if you see lung slide, you've 100% ruled out pneumothorax. So, and that's the first question asked in the blue protocol. Is there lung sliding? So if lung sliding is present, you have pretty much a transudative um, pleural space. Transudative mean that, that uh, pleural fluid is made and, and, and put into the pleural space and it's made to allow the, the visceral and pleural pleura to uh, rub up against each other. It's a very small amount of fluid, but that's what you're seeing right here. A transudative process tells you uh, essentially either you have a normal lung, you have pulmonary edema, you it, you uh, have a, maybe have a pulmonary embolism or COPD asthma. All it tells you is that it is normal lung. If it's absent, you can see so bat wing here, pleura here. There's no motion. It could be representing either an exudative process or absent. Absent being pneumothorax. If you're going to pull the pleura away from the chest wall, you're not going to be able to see it and they'll become more clear a little bit uh, later in the talk. What happens pneumonia, with pneumonia is pneumonia is uh, usually a more peripheral process. So when the, the, the infection abuts the lung, it's very inflammatory and it gets inflammatory and gums up the pleural space. So you'll lose a lot of the lung sliding. So really the idea behind lung sliding is it puts things into two boxes based on their pleural uh, uh, presentation. The second question asked is, do you have an A profile or a B profile? Well, what's an A profile? And just to step back, that little prime up there that you see with absent is just telling you that that puts it on the, the right side of the column that there's no lung sliding. So we're back to our bat wing sign, except I've, I've, I've increased the depth on this image a little bit. And if you remember that that slide I had with Harrison's internal mess or internal medicine, it said that air is dissipated once it hits the pleural line. Well, to me that that says that, that their philosophy is once you hit air, all that is is really all that information is not useless. And I disagree. They actually call that Merlin space, not because uh, of Fantasia. It's actually somebody's name that was assigned this, but. This is truly where all the, the good stuff, all the magic happens. Things like these horizontal lines that come in that we need to kind of find out what do they mean. So this is what happens. So we have a transducer and they put it up against the chest wall. What's gonna happen is the ultrasound beam is gonna come and it's gonna meet two reflectors. It's gonna hit air at the lung. So this is my interlobular fissure here. And this is a transducer fissure, or this is the transducer face. The ultrasound beam is gonna come out and it's going to hit the transducer and it's going to paint the pleura right where it's supposed to be. And then it's going to reverberate because there are such high specular reflectors. It's going to bounce back and forth. And every time it does that, it's going to paint a, a horizontal line at the same depth, deeper with lower intensity. And this is what it looks like. You can see it's equal distant down, lower intensity as it goes. And that's all that tells you is that it's air. 
you can do this with just a, a plain transducer. If you have a linear array transducer, go ahead and put some ultrasound gel on there. Once the beam comes out, it goes through the gel, it hits air, it'll bounce back and forth and you'll see uh, some form of reverberation artifact. The absent, so it's only found in normal lungs or in pneumothorax. The absence of A-lines means that something else has taken them over and we'll get into that shortly. So what's a B profile? B profile is a little bit different and I like to, to kind of start out by talking about curly B lines because everybody talks to them and they're just these little horizontal lines that are sometimes found in x-ray, mostly with people who have uh, pulmonary edema, but it's found in all kinds of other things. What we can also, this, this is what it looks like in ultrasound. It's the same place that it happens, but it looks much different. And to me, it represents a lot more information. It happens at the secondary lobule. The secondary lobule is just the endpoint of, of our pulmonary system. It's a bunch of uh, asini at the end of uh, the, 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 the bronchial tree uh, where the, all the gas exchange uh, takes place. And it's, 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 it's put into little boxes of, of interstitial tissue or uh, septa called uh, interlocular septa. And that's right here. This is where all all the things, most of the, the the initial changes from A lines to B lines happen with lung ultrasound. What we know is as the pump pump fails, we get as the heart fails, you end up getting pulmonary edema. At a, at a when it, the pressure gets the back pressure gets to be enough, A lines are now replaced by B lines. It's instant on, instant off. It's the first thing that you see. It's a very early indicator, and it's going to be a part of uh, uh, echo protocols within the next five to seven years. There's some amazing stuff coming out of the Italian literature right now on this. And this is how they're formed. Here we have a new interface. Our transducer is on the chest wall. We have a new interface. So the ultrasound beam is going to come, and it's going to get into the inner lobular fissure because it's now filled with fluid and it's gonna reverberate back and forth between the air here and the pleura. Now, to put this into perspective, I think Lichtenstein did a really good job describing this. You have an ultrasound beam moving at 1,540 meters per second, going into a structure about uh, 700 micrometers. That's about, I think it's three one hundredths of an inch. So it's very small. So you're putting a huge energy into a very small space and this big explosion kind of happens. And every time you the, the beam comes down, it bounces back and forth and you end up with this, this uh, uh, vertical artifact that's generated from the interlobular fissure. And that's a really important point because B lines are generated only from the visceral pleura. And again, uh, this is what they look like. You can see how they move with respiration. When you see B lines, uh, they, you essentially, in the anterior chest, you essentially have an interstitial syndrome. Interstitial syndrome meaning you have pulmonary edema, either cardiogenic or non cardiogenic pneumonia or pulmonary fibrosis. These are the criteria for using them. Um, when they say that that one of the criteria is a comet tail artifact, that doesn't mean that every comet tail artifact is, is a beeline. A beeline is a type of, of, of comet tail artifact. Uh, we all, uh, if you look at echocardi uh, an echocardiogram, uh, parasternal lung, you look at the pericardium, you have what looks like cometal artifacts. Those are actually called R lines. They rise from the pleural line 100% of the time and they move with lung sliding. Now, it's really important. I think one of the mistakes that's done with teaching lung ultrasound is depth. I see several things online where you're at four or five centimeters and you see these horizontal art or these linear uh, arty artifacts. Um, and the, 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 it's you can't really tell whether they're B lines or something else. Look, Lichtenstein's book was very academic and he defines a whole alphabet soup of, of, of artifacts based off of uh, ultrasound. And if you're not past seven or eight centimeters, there are some lines that mimic B lines that are very short, that would only go to three or four centimeters. They're called I lines and they don't represent anything. 
There's another artifact called Z-lines. They're the same thing, three, four, but three to four centimeters, but they don't move with respiration. But, and again, they're, they're parasites. They're just artifacts that don't mean anything. So um, let's do a little bit of quiz to get through the rest of this. So here we've got two pictures. Okay, I've got uh, right and left, both upper blue. I've got a rib here, rib here, pleura here, and I'm seeing B lines. So the first question is, is do we see lung sliding? And the answer is yes, we do. Do we have a B profile? Yes, we do. So what's our diagnosis going to be? Pulmonary edema. So if you see B profile diffusely across the anterior chest in the upper and lower blue, chances, very good chances that you are that you're dealing with uh, some type of a pulmonary edema, whether it's cardiogenic or non-cardiogenic. So in this image, do you see lung sliding? We do. We have an A profile. I don't see B lines. I see reverberation artifacts coming from the pleura that are equidistant and fading with time. So what do we do with this? We should really look at their legs is the recommendation. And there's a, uh, another really good podcast on here, a webinar uh, that kind of details this, but I'll touch it in brief. Most uh, 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 deep venous thrombosis are going to found, be found either in the popliteal space or in uh, the, uh, the, 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 the femoral vein proximally. Um, and we use a two-point technique where we're, we're taught with critical care is where we look at four views per side. We look at the common femoral vein, the junction of the greater saphenous vein, the takeoff of the profunda, and the popliteal. And it's not that hard. Either you have compression or you don't. If you don't have compression, as you see here, you have a DVT. You can throw some color on there and make sure that it doesn't fill up. So if you go down the road or the, the pathway and you see a thrombosed vein, they, they call that an A. So you have an A profile, DVT. So you have a pulmonary embolism. You have to be careful with this. And I, 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 uh, it works, but it, it's, it's not perfect. 30% um, of all people who have a pulmonary embolism will have no residual DVT. So you really should look at your per criteria or whatever you, whatever. Um, uh, risk stratification you want to use for pulmonary embolism. So if you go down this pathway and you see free veins, you want to look at Plaps point, which is again straight down from the uh, lower blue. And you may see something like this. So I've got liver here on the right, diaphragm here, but I've got this which looks like it's liver above the diaphragm. And I've got this, which is called shred sign. I'm not going to get into a lot of this because I really, you can really get into the weeds on this. But this is a consolidation. If you see something like this, now I'm on the left side, you've got spleen here, diaphragm here. You've got a, a moderately sized pleural effusion with some consolidated lung. Bottom line is if you see anything that looks like fluid or looks like liver above the diaphragm, you've got a plaps point. So A meaning you've got an A profile, your veins are clean, but you've got a positive plaps, positive plaps point. That represents a pneumonia. And people coming from the ER, they really shouldn't have something like this. If your plaps is clean, you have something called a nude profile. What I mean by that is you have a normal pleura, you have free veins, and you have nothing hanging out in your, your plaps point. That's essentially a normal lung. If I have one use for a stethoscope, it's wheezing. I cannot, I cannot use ultrasound for that. And, and you can just assume that it's most likely COPD or asthma. If you have any lung sliding, but you have something called an AB or C profile, AB meaning you have on the right side, B lines. On the left side, you have A lines or a C profile, which means I'm up the, I'm up the uh, upper blue point here, and I see something that comes in and out that looks like liver, and it's got B lines surrounding it or cometal artifacts distally. That's called a C profile or anterior consolidation. That represents, all of these represent a pneumonia. So we've looked at a little bit more than half the protocol. 
what's nice about this is, is this is where, in my mind, the money maker is uh, in the emergency room. Well, greater, if there's a pretty good study out there that came out uh, this year that showed that the majority are all going to be found on this side of the, the, the aisle with pulmonary edema and uh, a nude profile or you're dealing with COPD or asthma being the most common things found. To complete the, the other side of the graft, if you have lung sliding, which is absent, so you have an A prime profile, so bat wing here, and here's my pleura, I do not see anything here as far as uh, movement of the pleura. You have to look at something called lung point. We talked about lung slide, and if you see it, that 100% rules out pneumothorax. But if you don't see that, that does not tell you you have a, a, a pneumothorax. It suggests it because, again, pneumonias are usually peripheral, and they can really gum up the pleural space and, and really preclude lung slide. So what you have to do is you, you really should look for something called lung point. If I place the, the transducer on a, patient, on a patient who has a pneumothorax, anteriorly here I'll see bat wing sign, but I will not see uh, pleural motion because the pleura is pulled away from the chest wall. What I really have to do is move my transducer over to, and try and find a spot where the, 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 the lung meets the chest wall. And you'll get something that looks like this, where the the uh, lung comes in and out of view. So here, there's no pleura moving here. Here, there's pleura moving. Okay, you can see that point right there. It's called lung point. And that's what you're seeing here is as they breathe, the lung pulls away and reapproximates to the chest wall. And you're just seeing it um, uh, represented on your ultrasound screen. Here's a better image of what this looks like. You can see it coming in right here in and out. That tells me 100% this patient has a pneumothorax and I can treat it. So back to this, if I have an absent, if I have no lung slide and an eight prime profile, I have a pneumothorax. If I can't find lung point, uh, the recommendation is, is you, you base it off the clinical picture. If your patient is, ex is an extremist, then you put in a tube. If your patient is comfortable and you have time to look for, um, for another modality, whether it's chest X-ray, CT, you should do it. And the reason that you might not see lung point, and it's probably, my understanding is that it's a 60% of patients, you won't see it. It, it. it has to do with the fact that uh, most pneumothorax, or the majority of pneumothoraces can be complete in the emergency room. So the entire lung would be pulled away from the chest wall. There's something that I haven't seen yet, and that is if you have no lung slide, but you have a B, pro, B prime profile. And I'm assuming it would look like this. In the literature, it's very rare, but it would represent a pneumonia. And that's the, uh, the, the blue protocol. So just for example, this is a patient that I did a couple of weeks ago. We'll just call her Miss Some Patient. She had an op cab. Uh, I left on Friday and she was on three liters of oxygen. Uh, she's a big smoker, so she's got some pulmonary issues, I'm sure. I come in on Sunday, she's on 70% FiO2 and really kind of limping along. So our usual move in, in, in medicine is to uh, obviously listen to them, which is, is, is fairly ineffective, but uh, also to, to get an exam, and this is her her, her chest x-ray, this one is her preoperative, and this one is her uh, postoperative on post-op day four when she's struggling. And I see maybe a little pleural effusion here, a little pleural effusion here. Um, it doesn't look like she's in CHF to me. I see no pneumothorax. So really for somebody who's on that much oxygen, I don't find it very helpful. The, the radiologist uh, that I, I uh, I respect uh, agreed with me that this was kind of a small bilateral pleural effusions, but pretty unremarkable. So I went down my pathway. I went to the upper blue, the lower blue, diffuse B lines everywhere. She's in CHF, probably probably uh, residual fluid from surgery. She's just mobilizing it. I went a step further and looked at Plaps point. So I'm sorry, she's got, she's obviously, B, she's got lung sliding, which is present. Even just the, the, the suggestion of B lines tells me that she's got lung sliding. 
because they're generated from the viscera pleura. And I've got B profiles, so she's got pulmonary edema. I went one step further and looked at her PLAPS point. And on the right side, liver, diaphragm, moderately sized pleural effusion, probably compressive atelectasis here. And on the left side, she's got spleen here, heart here. This is all atelectatic lung. This is, this is her whole left lower lobe is down because you can see all the way through the lung to the heart. You shouldn't do that when you're looking at the lung. So that's all I have, and I really believe this. This is going to be uh, a real part of our existence in the next uh, several years, and I hope you enjoyed this.